Uh, and then a little later, I met Anthony Viorio, and uh, we started working together uh, with the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada, and he's the one who brought me into Ethereum. And I had about six, uh, six months at Ethereum, and it was a super stressful time. Too many founders, too much going on, too much drama. When you say too many founders, I feel like every second person I meet is like, I was a, I was an Ethereum founder. There's only Most a. of them are not There's even a. like written down. A lot of them yeah. are unofficial. Like this has very nebulous beginnings. Yeah, the first five people on Ethereum were Vitalik and Mihai. They were the very first two because Mihai and Vitalik did Bitcoin Magazine together. Emir Shatri, he was working with Vitalik on color coins and master coin because Vitalik was doing overlay protocols at the time. Uh, and then Anthony Diorio and, uh, brought me in. So we were the initial five. And then the first two real programmers we had were Jeff Wilchie and Gavin Wood. Mm -hmm. And they came in a little later. And then Anthony and uh, Vitalik kind of brought in Joe Lubin because he was hanging around the Toronto area. So I consider those eight people the founding set. And you could break them into the commercial side and the development side. And I was kind of in the middle where I had some rigorous knowledge of stuff but also I kind of had some business skill and I tried to keep them both together like an unstable element but it was very clear it was going to break one way or the other and on the commercial side we wanted to create a traditional company kind of like Ripple and get some VC money build the protocol and then release it through a not-for-profit the anarchy kind of not-for-profit side so just do a foundation do a crowd sale and release it and you know, uh, that's what they ended up doing. And so Amir left, and I left, and uh, Anthony left, and now he's leaving the space. Joe left, uh, and uh, he went and started his own company. My whole argument was that if you did a not-for-profit, there's no incentive for anybody to stick around. And now seven of the eight founders are gone. The only one who's left is Vitalik, and now two of the founders are directly competing with Ethereum, with uh, Gavin with Polkadot and myself with Cardano. If we were equity holders of a for-profit company, we'd kind of be locked in with non-competes. We'd only have to work on Ethereum. So it made a lot more sense to me. But then again, Ethereum is worth hundreds of billions of dollars. It's got a big ecosystem. So what the fuck do I know? You know, it's like it's like the big Lebowski. It's like, that's like your opinion, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, so opinion, man. we did Cardano and we're very happy with the whole thing. And you know, all the other stuff is just noise and drama and there's books written and, and that are just garbage. It's like something I, I don't even think much about anymore. I was only there for six months. I've been at Cardano, you know, building with IO Global for six years. Yeah, we went in, to Japan, 52 countries. We have 500 people. We've written 111 papers. You know, the ecosystem's worth $40 billion. You know, there's millions, actually billions of dollars of transactions that flow every day. We wrote programming languages. We meet heads of state on a regular basis. It's like, that's what I've been doing for the last six years. The problem is because Ethereum is such a big success, a lot of people want to just talk about Ethereum. Like, how did it happen? It's an accidental project. It, the only reason it exists is because Bitcoin can't upgrade itself, and it's really hard to do overlay protocols on it. Otherwise, Mastercoin uh, or Color Coins or something along those lines probably would have been Ethereum. You know, if Rootstock somehow had gotten done faster and they could have gotten Taproot in, there'd be no Ethereum today. But because Bitcoin couldn't act, it opened a market opportunity for something to come, and Ethereum was just in the right place at the right time with the right founders, the right community, and the right commercialization. And really it was the brilliance of Joe Lubin and his ability to market and gather adoption and build an ecosystem that Ethereum got to a point where it became a semi-stable market standard. Uh, that said, it, even the people who founded Ethereum agree it needs to be replaced. That's why they're building Ethereum too. Uh, so it opens up another opportunity for many people to come in and now that's why we have the third generation wars and you see like ICP and Polkadot and Tezos and Cardano.